Today, we are going to talk about some specific applications of nanomaterials in medicine. Do you know what is nanotechnology? Someone has an idea what nanotechnologies do is for life? What is nano? Pequeño. Something that is diminuto, very little one, something little. Well, we need to think about the scale of things in the nano world. And that's something that most of the times is completely outside of our normal world. I mean, we are used to things that are in the scale of meters, centimeters even, millimeters, but when we are talking about nanomaterials, we are talking about things that have a size that is only 10,000 fraction of a meter. Let me show you something that might be useful for that. You might know a tennis ball. You can have one in your hand. Well, that thing is around 100,000, 100 million times one nanometer. When you write a dot in your notebook, when you are taking notes, you are not taking notes right now, but there is going, there is going to be a, a brief test about what we are talking about right now. But if you were taking notes and you just write a small dot at the end of a paragraph, that period will be one million times of one nanometer. That means that if we have particles that have a size of one nanometer, we can put together one million of those nanoparticles inside one of these periods. And things that are a little bit more small and small and small, like a cancer cell, or even any type of cells, like uh, erythrocyte. You, you know what is an erythrocyte? An erythrocyte is this red blood cells that we have in our blood that are responsible to move oxygen to all our tissues. Well, an erythrocyte is more or less the same size that a cancer cell. That means a cancer cell that is around 10,000 to 100,000, the size of a nanoparticle of one nanometer is something really big. And that means that we can use nanomaterials that are much smaller to interact with the surface of cells or even bacteria or even virus or even biomolecules like sucrose, the normal sugar that our cells need to obtain energy. And we can mix these biomolecules, proteins, antibodies, sugars, carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, with nanomaterials in order to create new systems that can be able to have interesting interactions. Some of these interactions might be toxic, and then we can design nanomaterials that can be used to kill, for example, cancer cells, or can be used to detect. And if we can detect something, we can make a diagnosis, and that's always useful. For example, to know if one person has or not a specific disease like cancer. Well, if we keep going down, you will see that more or less the size of one nanomaterial that most of the definition says that, are, is that nanomaterials are in the range from one nanometer to 100 nanometers. Well, there are several nanomaterials that are a little bit bigger, even smaller than one micrometer. One micrometer is Something, like, I don't have a laser pointer here. Do you have, no, no, maybe it's not necessary. I'm going to use my, my laser pointer here. 
Okay. In this range, from 1 to 100 nanometers is the range where nanomaterials are usually described and synthesized and designed. You can have things that are a little bit larger than 100 nanometers, and they are still described as nanomaterials. But they are still very small, something that can interact with the surface or with the specific components of the membrane of bacteria or cells, or even with the materials that are usually found in biological structures like viruses. Well, so we can say that the world of nano things is a world that is completely outside of what we can see. It's an invisible world. You can believe that nanomaterial exists, and you can know about nanomaterials. I mean, you can think about faith or science. Something that Carl Sagan, so, someone knows who is Carl Sagan? Carl Sagan, he's already deceased. He was one of the best science popularization persons that ever existed. He, he, he used to have a TV program called Cosmos. Maybe you know about Cosmos because there is a new version of Cosmos that was a little bit popular some years ago with an astrophysics named New Degrees. New Degrees is an astrophysics in the Museum of Science in New York. Uh, and he also tried, he was a, a, a big admirer of Carl Sagan. Well, Carl Sagan, he used to say the following, I want to know, I don't want to believe. I don't want to believe, I want to know. Well, nanomaterials are in a scale that is completely outside of what we can perceive. So you can believe on them, or you can use the different tools of science and technology to manipulate and see what is in that scale. Well, the idea here is that when we use these nanomaterials for interaction with biological structures like cells, like tissues, like virus, like bacteria, we can design new ways for the treatment of different types of diseases. For example, we can use these nanomaterials as carriers to take drugs that have some specific pharmaceutical application, for example, for the treatment of cancer, and deliver that, those drugs to specific organs, tissues, or cells that might require without the problems that other traditional formulations for pharmaceutical formulation have. For example, they are not specific. They are not able to make a specific delivery of the drug to a specific organ or a specific tissue. So that means that when you take a pill, an aspirin, for example, the aspirin doesn't know where to go, where it needs to go, to treat you. So it's going to take some time to distribute every proportion and tissue of your, of your body. And most of the times, 99% of the aspirin that you take is going to be excreted, is going to interact with things that doesn't want to be interacting. And that means that you're going to have some secondary effects. I mean, for example, you take an aspirin and you feel like your uh, stomach is burning because it's acid. It, it attacks the mucus in the, in the intestine because it's an acid. And that means that you need to take another pill of a different type of drug in order to avoid the stomach ache that the aspirin that you are taking is causing. So, is not a specific. It might generate secondary effects, undesirable secondary effects. But when you are designing nanomaterials that might be used for specific applications in biomedicine, 
you are creating something that is more personal. I mean, that means that in the near future, you are going to be able to design specific treatments for each one of you. I mean, a personal medicine through nanomaterials, nanomedicine. And this is something that is going to have a big impact in the way how we take care of our health. There is a market, it's a market of nearly $2,000 billion that someone, for example, Mexican science working on the design and characterization of nanomaterials might be able to create something that might be useful for an innovative treatment of different types of diseases. And then he can take, or his group can take, a piece of this very interesting market of nanomedicine. And maybe around 20% of everything related to medicine, it can be a chirurgical instrument, it can be a band aid, like the ones that you put when you cut your hand, that will contain nanomaterials. And that means that you are not only going to find nanomaterials in therapeutic applications, for example, a formulation, a pharmaceutical formulation, but you can find it everywhere. You can find them even in the paint that they are going to be using for painting the inside of an hospital, because most of the times, in particular in these times, with the existence of these things called super bacteria that are resistant to almost any type of the current antibiotics that we have, well, these super bacteria are causing a lot of infections of people that go to the hospital and are supposed to be treated to, uh, to, to, to take care of their health. But inside of the hospital, these bacteria are very resistant, and most of the times the patient might be sick, derived from an infection, an intrahospitalary infection. But if you put everywhere a nanomaterial, like a coating in a, in a wall, in, a, uh, in, in, in the mobiliary that, that, you, that you have in the hospital, that is able to avoid infection because it's antibacterial, you can avoid a lot of these intra-hospitalary infections. Well, a nano is something that, as we, as we say, is very small, so it can be versatile, you can have savings in the space, you can have savings in the cost. I mean, many of the therapeutic treatments that we have already for different diseases like cancer are very expensive. There are some uh, formulations that might cost around uh, $100,000 for one dose, and that's something that is completely outside of the possibilities of many people to pay. So, but when we design a nanomaterial that might be able to take only one fraction of the pharmaceutical active component inside to have a very specific interaction with only one type of tissue or organ, we can decrease the cost of the treatment. Well, they also can be multiparametric. I mean, some nanomaterials are magnetic. Some nanomaterials can be optically active. I mean, they can shine when you irradiate the nanomaterial with light, with some specific type of light, and they use are fluorescent. So, because they can have different types of physical properties, you can use those physical properties for the design of different types of treatments, not only for carrying and delivering drugs, but also for diagnosis, or even for the direct treatment of the disease. And that means that that can be used for a new field of applications that is very important for current uh, pharmaceutical industries that is called Teranostics. Teranostics means that, just think about this, 
you go with your doctor because you have a stomach ache or you have something and you feel sick. And in the same session where he is checking your health, he can give you a pill and, and, and using his cell phone, he can track where the pill is going inside your body. Maybe the pill contains some nanomaterials or some active components that have a nano size and can be used for diagnosis in that moment. So he's going to say, oh, there is an infection in your liver because uh, the sensor that is attached to the nanomaterial is indicating the presence of something. Don't worry. And he press a button in his cell phone and immediately an electromagnetic signal is sent to the nanopill that is in your stomach or in your river or wherever it is in that moment and activates the delivery of the release of a specific treatment for that bacteria uh, or disease. And that means that in only one session you are able to make diagnosis and treatment. So you go and after 30 minutes maybe you get out of the doctor's office with the prescription and the treatment and the diagnosis. So everything in only one session. And that means a better care for our health, a personal medicine that can be uh, designed using nanomaterials. This is not sci-fi. This is something that already exists. There are several nanomedicines already in the market. For example, this one, that by the way, this Abraxan is currently manufactured in Mexico. There is a pharmaceutical company in Hidalgo, in Tizayuca, where some people are working, some, some of these people are uh, graduated, students graduated from our nanotechnology program, and they are preparing formulation that contains this type of nanoformulation. This is a nanoparticle made of one of the most abundant proteins that we have in our blood, albumin. albumin. Using albumin, we can build a nano cage that has a, 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 an empty space where we can put whatever we want. In this case, what we put is paclitaxel. cell. Paclitax cell is a pharmaceutical drug that is used for the treatment of some different types of cancers. Well, you can say, why I'm going to use a carrier for Paclitaxel if I can use administer Paclitaxel directly to the patient? Well, the problem is that Paclitaxel is poor, poorly soluble in water. So that means that if you try to put Paclitaxel, for example, by oral administration or by injection, you are going to need to apply a large volume of physiological solution containing Paclitaxel because the solubility is too low. And that means that the patient is going to need to stay there for hours. That is currently the situation for most of the patients that are treated with Paclitaxel. But when you encapsulate Paclitaxel in albumin, what is going to happen is that that the solubility is going to increase and you are not going to need to use the same concentration of Paclitaxel to treat the patient. That means that with a smaller amount of Paclitaxel and in a shorter time without the secondary effects that usually the patient have when the Paclitaxel is administered, you are going to have a better therapeutic effect. Well, and this is important because most of the patients that are treated for this type of cancer that require the administration of Paclitaxel are children. And you don't want to have a children several months in an hospital just being treated with a low therapeutic efficiency. 
And with all these uh, terrible secondary effects, like the hair falls, the Im immune system get depressed. So you want something that is more friendly for the patient, and that's something that we can reach using Abraxan, that is the nanomedicine, using this type of nano formulation. And another example is something that maybe you already have in your bodies. How many of you receive a vaccine against COVID? Just a question, what type of vaccine you receive? Pfizer, Moderna? Pfizer, okay. Pfizer and Moderna are two of these new vaccines that are using this type of technology. They have small nanoparticles, lipidic nanoparticles that contains inside of the cage. RNA messenger that contains genetic information that is used by our cells to build proteins that you can find in the surface of the virus and then our immune system is able to create antibodies against that and you get immunity. So what you got is a product of nanomedicine, a product that maybe is going to open the development of new applications, for example, against cancer, against many other diseases, and of course, against different types of viral uh, diseases that you can be sure are going to be appearing in the future. Right now, we have a new viral disease, this monkey, uh, what's the name? Monkey, oh, viruela, mono. Monkey pups? Well, I don't remember the, the precise name. But we are going to be seeing in the next years a lot of new viral diseases. One, because climate, climate change. This climate change is going to be moving all these diseases that are right now hiding in forests and different parts of the ecosystems outside. And that means that we are going to be exposed more and more frequently to this type of new viruses. They are, they are not new. They have been around maybe more time than humanity, but they, we are not always interacting with them. But, um, by the way, virus, some way, they are nanomaterials because they, they have sizes that are smaller than most of the times 100 nanometers. Well, but you have nanomedicine, you have been using nanomedicine, you are safe right now against a terrible disease, COVID-19, COVID because nanomedicine. Well, and there is a large history about the use of nanomaterials in medicine. I'm not going to describe everything here, but you can see that since maybe 300 years ago, we have been exploring the use of different types of materials, some of them nanomaterials, for biomedical applications. And right now, that means that we are just in the right time to know how the applications of these nanomaterials are going to be useful or not to for the treatment, for the diagnosis, or for different applications in medicine. Well, but don't worry about the risks, because some of the times we can be thinking about all oh, these nanomaterials can be everywhere and can be everywhere. We have this mask and they are useful for avoiding the movement of aerosols. Aerosols are micrometric. If there is something nano floating around, these things are not useful. I mean, they are smaller than the pores, the holes that you can find in this mask. Nano things can pass through most of the biological barriers and physical barriers that we have. However, we can use that in our favor because we can design nanomaterials that can be able to cross selectively through different types of physical and biological barriers in order to have a specific biomedical application. 
In our laboratory at UDLAB, we are working with magnetic nanoparticles. And the reason why we are working with magnetic nanoparticles is very easy. They are easy for synthesizing. They are cheap. You can use an external magnet to interact with the magnetic nanoparticles, and then it can be very easy to purify, to separate the product from the mixtures. And you can use also these external magnetic fields to create, for example, medical imaging of the interior of a body, for example. Someone maybe has been uh, required sometime uh, to take an MRI. You know what is an MRI? A medical uh, magnetic resonance imaging of our body. Uh, and that seems like something magic because you can see inside of your body without the need of the doctor to cut you in two pieces. Uh, and you can see even the organs, how they are moving, how they are working. And most of the times you can create high resolution images using contrast agents. And these contrast agents can be designed using magnetic nanoparticles. So that's one of the, some of the reasons why we are working, we prefer to work with magnetic nanoparticles. You can see here is they are easy for synthesizing. We can use only chemistry to prepare different types of magnetic nanoparticles. And as, as I say, when you put close uh, external magnet, strong magnet, like an aluminum magnet, you can use, attract all the magnetic nanoparticles and separate them from the rest of the mixture. Once we have the magnetic nanoparticles, we use a lot of tools, and that's something that for the people like me that dedicates professionally to this type of fields is fun because we have a lot of toys, electron microscopes, spectrophotometers, and many others in order to know the nature, the composition, the structure, and many other properties of the materials that we are preparing. So we can know very well what is the size, what is the distribution, what is the chemical composition, what is the crystallinity, and then we can modify the surface of the particles in order to increase their solubility, to decrease toxicity, increasing bioavailability also. And also we can put on the surface whatever we want. We can put something that maybe shines when we irradiate when light. We can put something that can be used for the specific interactions with the surface of our cells. I mean, a molecule that is able to generate a recognition, molecular recognition, with a structure on the surface of the membrane of the cell. Well, and after all this, that is chemistry, use chemistry and more chemistry. This is what I say about the surface modification of the particles. We can evaluate the properties of these particles when they interact with a cell. For example, in this research, what we did was to immobilize a molecule that is like food for cancer cells, folic acid. Well, this folic acid, once is immobilized on the surface of the magnetic nanoparticles, we make some testing with cells. These are two types of cells, cancer cells and normal cells. When we make these cells to interact with the magnetic nanoparticles that have been modified with this molecule, folic acid, we can check if the cells die or not. If it's a cancer cell if and dies, that's good because that means that that system might be used, but might be useful for the treatment of cancer. But if it kills cancer cells, we want that normal cells are not affected by the interaction with this type of molecules. Well, and what we see is that the nanoparticles that we are designing are specific for killing cancer cells and not normal cells. That's good. And now what we want to know is 
what happens if we change the things that are on the surface. So I'm not going to be uh, explaining in detail this because it might be a little bit more boring. But when you change the type of molecules that is on the surface, you can increase the selectivity against the target that you desire. I mean, we are looking to design nanoparticles that can be used for cancer treatment. And we are near to achieve something that is 100% selective to kill cancer cells and not killing normal cells just by changing the type of molecules that are attached on the surface of the magnetic nanoparticles. Of course, this is useful in the lab. You are not able to take this information and go to the newspaper and say, Mexican science cure cancer. Mexican science was able, in a controlled laboratory experiment, to kill cancer cells in a cell culture. That's the truth. We are maybe many years far away of the moment that we can say we are able to treat selectively and efficiently cancer patients using this type of therapeutic approach. But maybe, if I live enough, we will be able to see that in 10 years, 15 years. We make also some experiments using animal models that sometimes require. And we did that because we want to see what happened when we administer the nanoparticles to a living subject. Well, in this case, we were using mice. And what we see is that there is no affectation in some key organs, brain, liver, and kidney. Well, the details is, if you see the different images and compare it with the control, you don't see any morphological changes. That means that the tissues, the cells are okay. They are not stressed, they are not suffering some type of toxic interactions with the magnetic nanoparticles with the different types of modifications on the surface. But maybe we can say, well, that's mean that, that we don't see anything. We don't see any toxicological effects because the nanoparticles are not there. Remember, they are invisible. We cannot see them. But we use a special technique to change the color of the particles to blue. And we confirm that in the different tissues of the organs, the nanoparticles are present. You can see here in the red circles, there is something blue. This blue thing are the nanoparticles that they are inside of the different organs, brain, kidney, and liver that we extract from the model, from the animal models. I'm going to move a little bit faster here. We then change the nature of the molecule that we put on the surface. This is, uh, this is a derivative of vitamin E. Maybe in your home, your mother sometimes insist that you need vitamins and inject you with some uh, vitamin complex like B12 or something like that, that all are, by the way, not water soluble. They are oily soluble. So that means that when your mother put the injection, it, it's a big pain. You cannot maybe move for a while. Meanwhile, the thing is just diffusing through your body. Well, this derivative of vitamin E has been shown that has very good activity against cancer cells, but has a big problem. It's not soluble. So we attach that molecule, this derivative, on the surface of these magnetic nanoparticles. And what we see is that we repeat the experiments of interactions with different types of cells, normal cells and cancer cells. And what we saw is that, you can see it here, the vitamin E derivative attached on the surface of the magnetic nanoparticles is toxic against the cancer cells, but not, is not toxic to 
the normal cells. That means, again, we have something that is more selective for the treatment of cancer. Well, there is some nice pictures that show how, for example, these are the cancer cells that are killed, you, you can see here, they, they, they change the shape, that means that they are dying. And we can see here, because we modify the surface of the magnetic nanoparticles so they can be fluorescent, that the magnetic nanoparticles are very close to the nucleus of the cells. Well, I'm going to move forward here because this is not so important. We can also use this not only for the treatment of cancer. We found out that these magnetic nanoparticles are able to move to the brain. And that's very important because there are very few pharmaceutical formulations that are able to reach directly the brain. So if we use these nanocarriers for develop, for designing, new treatments for neurological disorders like Parkinson or Alzheimer, we can have something very interesting in hand. So what we did is to put some dopamine that is not able to cross the brain blood barrier that protects our brain from anything that is circulating in our blood inside of magnetic nanoparticles. We characterize them, we see how they interact with cells, we check that the magnetic nanoparticles when interacting with the cells are inside of the cells. This is, uh, these are uh, deposits inside of the cells of the magnetic nanoparticles. So, literally, the cell is able to eat the magnetic nanoparticles and put it inside, inside of a small structure. And after that, we treat some animal models of Parkinson's disease with our system. And what we saw that is that after exposition of the animals, of these animal models of Parkinson's disease to the magnetic nanoparticles loaded with dopamine, there was a reduction of nearly 50% of the disease in the model. That means, if you translate that to a human being, you might know maybe in family, someone, I have an uncle that has Parkinson, they have this non-controllable movement that affects daily their lives. Well, if we move that to a human patient, what we will see is that the patient is going to control the movement because somehow the nanoparticles are going to be able to move through the brain blood barrier and deliver dopamine directly into the brain, in some way treating the Parkinson's disease. And they are there. Well, these are some histological cuts where you can see in brain, we can find the nanoparticles. Well, just let me show you some of the last things. This is the work of one of my students in UDLA, who recently graduated doing this type of systems. They, they look like sponges. They are made of silica. And you can put small particles of magnetic nanomaterials inside of these sponges and they can be used for drug delivery used by using magnetic fields, external magnetic fields. You can just be carrying the magnetic nanoparticles so they can move and accumulate in specific regions of your body to have this pharmaceutical or uh, biological activity. Uh, and finally, this is something that we also did using these magnetic nanoparticles. This is a biosensor that is used for dengue diagnosis. Currently, there are more people dying every year, around four or five millions of persons in all the world by dengue, because there is not a specific and cheap way to detect and treat the disease. But we designed something that changed color using these magnetic nanoparticles. They turn blue when they are exposed to blood 
that contains a specific protein that is present when the person has at least one week of infection of dengue. So this is something that maybe costs 50 cents and is very easy and in 30 minutes is able to help a physician to determine if a person has or not dengue in an early stage of the disease. So that means that it can be treated and the probability of that is going to be very low. Well, and all this work has been made by a lot of people, not by me. These are the students that in different stages in the last 10 years have been doing all the experimental work. Uh, these are some of the institutions that have been collaborating with us on the development of this type of research. And these are just some pictures of UDLA. And if you have any question, if there is time for questions, just make the question. I will be happy to try to answer. Thank you very much.